fear that we feel that they have something out that the majority of the people don't know about. Ey ulan bütün halkların hakları gibi haklar. Ne aşağı ne yukarı. Ne fazla ne azdır. Ne feelings that that may result from decades of repression and people who've had members of their family killed by that regime. A lot of killers. Get a lot of killers. Why well, you think our country's so innocent? But I won't attack it because someone fixed me up. I don't let anybody use me to fight their battles. Hello and welcome to Varm Blog. And today I am with Jason Miles, host of This Is Revolution Show, um, longtime friend of my show, uh, provider of all music on any of the versions of the show. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I felt bad. I felt bad as you're playing that. Someone had hit me up recently. Recently, mm -hmm. um, hit me up personally on a DM, and they said. Um, can I get that music? I've looked everywhere. I can't find that music that you have for Varn. And I said, uh, I'll look for it. I don't know where it is <laughs> because I think they think I label it all and have it cataloged. And, um, all this stuff is late night, uh, recordings. I live alone here in Mexico. I don't sleep much. And I'm like, I'm going to make as much music as I possibly can. And then I give it to Jean Bajlan and then he, put the last the last video thing together so i would love to know what where that song is from i remember recording it vividly but i don't know where it is yep and for those of you who don't know the classic intro was actually made by you um the 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 spooky intro which i now use for art shows uh this show is interesting jason because it's somewhere in between my normal political rage shows and political you know academia guest and um, and my art shows, um, because we're talking about Woodstock and new metal and hippies <laughs> and boomers and, but we are, I decided to go with the, with the classic intro because, um, and for those of you who listen to this only on the podcast, you get the, the old intro regardless. Sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, because it's we're talking about the political valence of it you have an article that's going to be coming out with sub, uh with sublation magazine on this recent rash and i actually kind of want to why do you think there's a interest in woodstock 99 right now uh i'll be honest mm -hmm. right before i left the festival world they were trying to do another woodstock Okay. And it went from three days. Most festivals are three days, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Mm -hmm. um, things like Coachella start on Thursday, technically, but there's not a lot of music. Um, and the ticket sales were really low. And then it went from three days to one day. And it was going to be two different Woodstocks. So we're going to have one that was more reminiscent of the nostalgic 69 show. And then we're going to have one that was more contemporary. And both things kind of failed. And I think these things were made as that was going to come out as a promotion because it's not quite like 25 years after one or the other. Mm -hmm. um, and that's generally how that stuff works. Uh, it could just be a coincidence that they just made both of these things, much like the Fry Festival documentaries that came out around the same time. Um, I, I, I honestly don't know. Uh, TV production has never been my world. Music production and then live event production has been my world. Working large festivals like Coachella and, and EDC and you know, name one that, that has over 50,000 people and I've probably been at it in the last five or six years. Yeah. It. From, from, a, from a standpoint of doing actual numbers for the festival, like financial numbers. So I'm not oh, there. interesting. Yeah. So, so you and I, uh, I used to be way way long time ago a music journalist i don't talk about this much because i was in the zine world uh in the late 90s and early aughts um mostly in the athens atlanta making oh okay zines. i have someone that you should meet actually um i'll have to send you a personal message that he actually did a documentary on the athens punk scene in the 80s oh wow it was bill um, cody 
Okay, so like uh, both the Athens punk scene, the elephant, uh, the the elephant six stuff, um, and you know, so five eight, uh, the stuff around Bob Mold, yeah, uh, Jeff Magnum of Nutrimental Health, Hell, who I who I really did see before they were famous because they went famous <laughs> after he basically went crazy, disappeared, and was couch surfingly homeless as that album like took off like five years after it came out. Like it was bizarre the story of how Neutral Milk Hotel became super famous, but uh, this that's my world and the other part of that world and this is why I know a little about festivals and I can go I can go into stories uh, horror stories actually because my my youngest brother uh, and I'm not going to name him but it, it is an ex con and one of the one he was able to make a lucrative career for himself as a rigger at festivals. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's a lot of what he does. Uh, the horror stories come with uh, how, you know, even though they make good money, they're off. A lot of them are uninsured if they're not in the guild. Uh, and there's and they often get hurt and stuff can come out of that. But uh, that's not what we're here to talk about today, although it kind of is. Um, it, it should be. It actually should be. You know, the last Coachella, I, I, was, I wasn't physically there. The last mm -hmm. one that I was doing some number stuff for. Um, but uh, someone died. That was the one the year after Beyonce. So it was like 2018, 2019. Um, someone died, actually. A rigor died. I think people really underestimate how many people die at these yes. festivals and concerts. Like, yes. Um, because I was looking at the numbers for for all the Woodstocks, and what one people forget people died at all of them. Yep. Um, everyone. Uh. God, the amount of lawsuits from the first one, you know, I was reading your article and I'm like, I've forgotten they were that astronomical. Mm -hmm. um, but also, like, I think even non infamous shows often, you like, <laughs> people die at them all the time. Yeah. Um, there's a reason why the insurance on this shit is usually really high. <laughs> and they're changing. You know, the when you look at these Woodstocks, especially when you look at 99, mm -hmm. they kept going back to the same well for nostalgic purposes because, and we'll probably get into this a little bit more in the show, but late August in New York is very hot and is extremely humid. And they never really had an infrastructure in 69. They definitely didn't have one in 94 that could hold it. In 99, when they did have an infrastructure, you know, we'll, we'll get into that. But when you look at something like Coachella, that have, it happens in April because it's in the desert. It's hot in April, but it's not August hot, <laughs> right? I used to work EDC, Electric Daisy Carnival, in, um, in Vegas when it moved to Vegas. And um, the first time I was there, they did it in like June or July. I can't remember, but I know it was in the summer. And it was like 110 degrees. And we're walking around at 1 a.m. And it's still 100 degrees. And you just see people just falling, just falling. And then they got smart and they moved it to May. And it, it was a literally a 200% improvement. Literally, the first day a festival made more than the whole weekend before because of a change and when you're going to have it. So when we think about some of these things and we think about deaths, um, you never really think about heat stroke and exhaustion because these things are set up so differently now. And I'm sure we'll get into the why they're set up differently. But uh, that was a very common occurrence in 69. It definitely happened in mass in 94 and it, again in 99. One of the things I think we, we, we need to talk about, because I, I would say that the rewriting of 99's Woodstock happened pretty quickly, um, yes. like the, the rewriting of history. Um, 94 was sold as a success, even though it kind of wasn't. Mm -hmm. um, and the context, and I think people miss this, the context of the festival because starting with Lollapalooza, which I think is mm. really what brings mm -hmm. 94, like mm. the infrastructure and the traveling festival of bringing people, maybe we can do these big stationary festivals again, mm. um, the, the, like they did in the 60s for the boomers. I think that's often left out of the story about why they thought 25 years later was, you know, for 94 was a good idea. 
um, it wasn't just generational. It's like we have this infrastructure now. We are using it for traveling, uh, uh, traveling festivals. And you add to that, and you mentioned some of these in your article, but you add to that Lilith Fair, OzFest, Warp Tour. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, Lala was a traveling one. Um, yeah. There was one called Taste of Chaos that was a right. an outgrowth of, of Warp Tour for slightly older people. There was one called the Family Values Tour that happened in the late 90s and early 2000s with the new right. metal bands. Yeah, I was thinking about all the all the all the heavy metal and new metal uh, tours, which rock the bells from hip hop. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, And then you know Coachella and all that happens a little later, which starts the it kind of does start these state these kind of stable (sighs) singular location tours again. Um, Yeah. It's ninety nine happens at the height of all that and. And I think people, you know, reading your show, I've always been like uh, your article. And I was like, why do people think Mm -hmm. that Woodstock 99 was about the genre of music or or like Gen X um, and early, very early millennial nihilism or anything like that? Mm -hmm. Um, Because there was regular festivals during that time period all the damn time. And this is not even including all the local festivals like Midtown mm-hmm. Music in Atlanta and this and the other. Uh, now, a lot of these have now gone away. Um, mm-hmm. I think COVID finished a lot of them off. Before um, COVID, there was a 45% drop. In 2017, mm-hmm. I think we were losing 45% of the festivals we were doing. 45% of the festivals we were doing were lost. The East Coast took it really hard. There was really nothing they could sell in New York, surprisingly, as such a big market. Um, but COVID was a death nail in anything that was barely hanging on. I agree with you on that. Yeah, because like Warp Tour ends, right? But like, you know, with COVID. Warp and- Tour was another one of those things. And I, and I think, and I want to say this first and foremost, festivals are about selling product. The music, then what's the product? <laughs> the, the music is the background. And there was no product to really sell in 69. They didn't understand that. And they never even understood it in 99, to be honest with you. Um, they really still thought the product was the music because you could still sell music to a certain degree. We're still at the height of CD sales. We have to remember mm-hmm. that. By the time you get into the later years of Coachella, you're selling stuff. You're not selling music. You're selling the experience, right? It doesn't really matter who's the headliner. It's the experience of going there. Right. And and that's what Woodstock had going for it until 99, that it had this name recognition. Even when you think about something like Warp Tour for Children, that was about vans and sugary energy, energy drinks. That's really what it's about the whole time. Yep. You know, you really think it was about ska music and and then metalcore in 06. No, it was about, I want to sell young people, sugary drinks, cigarettes, and, and, and a lifestyle. So every, every stage, when you think about festivals, you know, moving forward from 99, maybe from the mid two thousands on, especially when you start bringing in things like credit cards, even in 99, it was still cash only business. Right. Um, when you start bringing in things like credit cards into the, into play and monitoring people's spending <laughs> as I lock you in this <laughs> little cityscape for up to three days or four days with the bigger camping ones, um, it, it really is about selling data and about uh, a selling product. And it's never really about any sort of... Um, music gathering like you think it is because there's so many corporate sponsors that are in there literally putting everything together every stage everything you go into is sponsored there's not one thing that isn't sponsored by a corporation you know down to the to the soda you have to sell or the beer you have to sell and it's it's a it's pretty it's pretty (laughs) they're pretty corporate controlled at this point 
Um, even if you looked at things like Woodstock when it came down to like the beverages they were going to sell, you know, we're talking again in the nineties and then we're not talking 69 is a whole different beast um, because we don't know what these things look like um, in, in the sixties and they haven't the been on the scale that massive domestically since. I mean, the sixties is, is interesting because basically uh, you have the Monterey pop festival Mm -hmm. um huge success and, yeah and it's a huge success then you have what's that festival that the hell's ultima. angels in ultima uh where which is not but very similar actually to to to, to woodstock 99 in fact in some ways worse <laughs> um um you know it, it's and in the 60s yeah you, they don't really know what this is for as far as it's its place in capitalism and music. I mean, one of the reason why I think we have this nostalgia for boomer music. Um, and I think this is legitimate. And I think people, even young people have this nostalgia for boomer music is because it's like film in the late nineties or the late, or the late, mm. or the mid seventies. Mm. It's a time where the old market mm. of singles fell apart. You mm. could have bands that were still, top 10 sellers like refuse to do singles and people just play random shit off of a yeah. off of an lp I, I think of like uh pink floyd yeah you know pink floyd had no singles po policy right led zeppelin yeah led zeppelin another one like these are not this is but this is because no one knows how to market this shit yet mm -hmm. uh it's not it's not because you know a lot of these periods of hyper um, uh, artistic fecundity and pop music comes during breakdowns of a prior organizational form. So this is clear in film and this is actually clear in music too. I mean, and, and I think that's also why indie music had this big explosion in the aughts because the CD distribution completely fell apart. Um, and, now, and major labels uh, needed write-offs. And that's actually yeah. why you have um, a lot of arty music and arty movies that come out in the in the eighties and nineties because major studios needed write offs. Right. So you could get big people to release risky stuff to write off the losses and mm -hmm. to see. It's basically a, a throwing spaghetti at the wall strategy. Honestly, Kiss of the Spider Woman is a bit of an art film, right? But a major yeah. studio does it. Spike Lee's movies. After she's got to have it. These are some, somewhat art films, but major studios are releasing them because they now have this wiggle room and also these small art films are very cheap to make and the returns are great. It always boils down to how cheap is it to make and how big is your return going to be, right? That's right. what it always boils down to. And the interesting thing about the 60s is this is pre the big stadium era of the 70s. This is before the pomp of the 70s. Not to say these guys weren't making a lot of money, but if you look at from from Woodstock, how much, um, first of all, when you look at 69, and I think people need to understand this about 69 before we go on uh, an idealistic bashing, let's get into the facts of 69. The two men that proposed the idea to fund anything were two very young, aspiring venture capitalists that wanted to invest in something. They just didn't know what to put their money into. And they put an ad out in the paper. You got an idea for us to fund? We'll listen to you. And uh, one of the, there's four main guys for the first Woodstock. And one of the guys was a record producer. And he had wrote um, Dead Man's Curve for Jan and Dean. And he knew Michael Lang, who was an aspiring uh, concert promoter music guy. And they wanted to build a studio in Woodstock because they had a bunch of friends that did music. They're like, be dope. If we can have a studio, we could build it. We need like a million bucks. And they're telling these venture capitalists what they need. And they're like, you know what we should do? We should throw a show. Michael just threw a show for 25,000 people. He had Jimi Hendrix perform in New York. Let's throw a show out here in upstate and do it. And that's Woodstock. That is why you have Woodstock. Not because they loved peace, not because they loved hippies or free drugs. They literally, you have a handful of people that want to invest in something, two people that want to invest in something, 
and two guys that want to build a studio. That's all it is. And this idea gets blown out and built out and they actually lose a permit about a week or two before the show day. Any other time, if this happens today, no festival. That's Fry Festival. Nobody's showing up to that shit. Mm-hmm. If you do that shit today, first and foremost, you got to pay everybody half. I don't know if people know this. When you say, I want to book all these acts, you got to give them half, depending on who it is. Then depending on who you are, if you're a nobody, you might have to give me 80% because I don't know who the fuck you are. Right? Sorry mm-hmm. for cursing. But, okay. um, we curse on the show. <laughs> but... Uh, and, and the going rate at the time for artists in 69 was like five grand to play a show that size. And they said, we're finna, we, we're so flush. We're finna give y'all 12. We'll give you guys $12,000 to play this thing that we're going to do in upstate New York that we literally can't get a permit for. Information doesn't travel as fast as it did back like it does today, right? You think if all those dudes would have known they didn't even have a site a week beforehand, they would have showed up and they had no way to get in and out. They would be like, it sounds like a nightmare. How are you even going to build a stage for us? Right. That yeah, thing was yeah. bound to fail, you, you know, and, and I believe their original uh, place they had, which had an infrastructure in it. Remember when they move it, they don't even have running water. Um, the first place they had it was like seven thousand dollars, and because a, an article came out in the local paper that says, "Oh, these hippies lose their permit; they can't have their festival," a farm owner calls them up and says, "Hey, I just read the article about you guys in the paper. You can use my farm. I got six hundred acres." And they're like, "Okay, fine." And you know, when they get there, like, "Well, how much is going to cost us?" He goes, "Well, how much will you pay any other people?" And they said seven seventy five hundred dollars, whatever. And they and the guy goes, put a zero on the end of that, and you can use my land. So already <laughs> you're paying, you know, ten times as much as you were paying for your original spot. But again, you had money to work with. These guys, they had, they already had money. Um, one of them had a very large trust fund because he was the heir of a um, denture, like a polydent kind of company throne. Um, and he was able to take loans against his trust fund to, to be able to get the money. And they sold a hundred thousand tickets. So mm-hmm. the, the feeling was our walk up is going to be so insane. And we have so much space that from tickets alone, we'll be able to make the money to pay for everything. And then we can supply free food or whatever like an art festival too. and you know they bum rush the gate they assume about 50,000 people are in the venue before it's even time to take tickets and that's when they have that uh, discussion that you can watch in the Woodstock movie where they're like you can't go in there and tell these people to get out and then charge the money and one of the beefs was well they came here with money anyway <laughs> they were gonna spend it we might as well take it. So that lasted maybe five minutes. Like we're going to have a riot on our hands if we don't let them in for free. And so they just let people breach the gate and said, fine, everybody's in for free. So right there, you're everything you're operating on a loss. You're just hemorrhaging money from then on out. And then the technical issues, it rained that caused problems. They almost shocked 50,000 people. <laughs> Wiring ain't the same as it as it is now, like it was in the back then, right? They had a tarp. Yeah, it's often not as good now as people think it is either. <laughs> Go ahead. And I've seen some scary things in some of these places, <laughs> but imagine in '69 and everything is makeshift. This mm-hmm. is a fire festival size nightmare. How are you going to feed people? How are they going to get water in if it wasn't for the National Guard? helicoptering people out to hospitals would have been more deaths at the first Woodstock. So many people were trying to leave. If you ever watch Jimi Hendrix playing the national anthem, 
um, everybody's damn near gone at that point. That's why in Woodstock 99, if you remember, they're like, um, in one of the documentaries, they talk about the fact that people were saying, oh, someone special is going to come back. They're going to do a special thing for 99 because the 30 year anniversary. Well, Michael Lang knew from 30 years before, if there's nothing for anyone to stay for, they're just going to leave before even the, the last artist is done. For just, to, just to get out of town and not get stuck in traffic. You know what I mean? Um, so he kind of knew how to, to a certain degree, hype stuff up. But what's interesting about Woodstock and how it sits in our memory is this could sit in your memory as a massive disaster because it was a massive disaster for the local farmers afterwards. Um, again, three or four people died in the first one. I can't remember. It was a two overdoses and one person got ran over by a tractor in the first one. Tons of people got airlifted out. Um, no baby was born. That's not true. Um, and they had, I think, over 80 lawsuits. A bunch of them got dismissed, but they did have to pay on some. They ended up losing over $2 million in the first one. After that, you would think these people maybe aren't the guys to go talk to about throwing a festival. A few months later, Michael Lang does Altamont. You're like, how? Because it was seen as a success by leftist press, right? Because there was no riot. Peace went out. Then you get Altamont, which where the stones say, maybe we should get... Um, the Hell's Angels would be security because they couldn't they couldn't get security. For the original Woodstock, they couldn't get security. They had off-duty cops, and a bunch of those dudes like left. They always had structural problems that wouldn't be tolerated today that we would probably laugh at. And I can't blame those problems just on the time. That was just really inept planning and management. And what happened with Altamont is the same thing that happened with Woodstock. They had to move location last minute. And they built a stage out that was too low. One of the Jefferson Starship got knocked unconscious by a Hell's Angel. They were fighting because they, they thought the dudes were being too, too difficult in the crowd with the fans. So we can, we can look at Altamont and say this is the end of the 60s because it does happen towards the end of the year. But Woodstock is supposed to be celebrated as the 60s you know, kind of pinnacle moment, which I find very interesting because both of these moments is literally just about capitalism. Whatever great music comes out of that time, what other great performances come out of that time? What, sure. But these shows were never really about Santana's 20 minute guitar solo. It was about commerce. And they were, you know, Altamont, Woodstock, and then Woodstock 94 becomes a failure. But by the time you get to Woodstock 94, it's a marketable brand name when it comes to iconic American festivals. Right. I mean, this is, uh, there's a whole lot tied into this. And I, I do want to like spend a little time sure, on, the, sure, sure. on the American press just a bit. And then the boomer recapitulation of that in the late 80s and 90s. Um, mm. uh, one of the one of the myths, the foundational myths, and and you know it's a liberal historian who debunks this myth. Not a good Marxist, but th these books are actually excellent. Which is the books um, by Rick Perlstein, mm. uh, mm -hmm. um, "Before the Storm," "Nixon Land," "The Invisible Bridge," and "Reagan Land." Um, mm. And what you learn is one: the New Left was mostly silent generation, not boomers anyway. Two. The relationship between High Aspie and the New Left is tangentious AF. Anyway, <laughs> three, um, the relationship of the anti-war movement with High Aspie is more real, but it's still tangentious. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of a, you know, the SDS makes uh, ties that into the history 
of the new left directly. So that's that is real, but it's kind of also two separate developments that just kind of converge on one thing and then get rewritten um, weirdly because of anti-war protest in Ohio of all places as a kind of unified political movement. And then in the leftist political imagination, and by this, I mean the far leftist political imagination gets tied into the European uprisings and the anti-colonial uprisings in 1968 Mm -hmm. which they don't really have that much of a direct connection to. Now, in the popular imagination, by the time you get to the 90s, all this leftist political stuff is a vibe. Like, <laughs> like <laughs> it's a vibe that people throw around as a cultural vibe. And they mention some of this, but then they'll talk about like, the excesses of the weathermen, you know, the days of rage. And, and I think people also have no idea that it, because when, even when people talk, like, I love it when boomers are like, this is like five, six years ago, this is the most divisive time in American history. And I'm like, okay, on like a super fiddle political sense, that's true until you go back to the Civil War. But I, I want to remind you, the days of rage happened. Do you know how many political assassinations and bombings happened in the early 70s? It's like on the scale of thousands. Um, you know, there was literally like a weekly, a, like a weekly, we just hijack a plane and take it to Cuba and Cuba sends, sends the people back. And that just happens and no one cares. Like <laughs> that's the context. But by the, the reason why I think you had to wait till after Reagan mm -hmm. for this to happen. All right. Is that you needed time for a couple of things to happen. One, people always overestimate how progressive the overall boomer generation was and Pearlstein like has hard numbers on this um in fact anti-war sentiment despite what people think was actually more popular by by like normies in their 30s um in the 60s than kids until the late 60s you know why though it's because people had to deal with the effects of war so if you lived in a small town regardless of where you were in the country east coast west coast or in a flyover state you were going to deal with damaged men returning home yep um, and we're coming home from korea which is like the war that we kind of don't talk about yeah you know um and a lot of families that would be be conservative or even reactionary were against Vietnam because they saw what had happened to Korea. It didn't feel like World War II to them. And they're like, I don't want my young man to go off to war and come back with no limbs or not come back at all. This, I think people forget. Um, one, Vietnam was an LBJ war. LBJ was in the most progressive president between FDR and well ever like yeah. <laughs> honestly like yeah. um his adoption and belief in the cold war however complicates all this and it also complicates the fact that it is absolutely true that it's the Viet Cong and then and, and to a lesser degree Nixon that in the war not anything that happens in the anti-war protest movement. Um, and the anti-war protest movement does become popular amongst youthful people by 69. You know, Pearlstein illustrates this. But n not until then, most of the 60s, the war is popular until the height of the draft. Um, and you're also correct. And, and you know, this is actually, this is my experience on the right is kind of how I know this. And this is not a myth. Um, mm -hmm. The paleoconservative right points out that they were in the 50s and 60s more consistently anti-war than the Democrats. And the left was pretty consistently anti-war as well. But you have this whole popular front thing with the Democrats that really confused that during the, the during the entirety of the 60s and that the left had also been decimated mm -hmm. in the 50s yeah. yeah 
So this is, to me, the interesting thing about our, our memory of this time period is we see this as part of this global uprising. And this is actually kind of sold to us, some by old leftists, you know, we, you know, I talked about this on your show, that are beginning to die off now. And, and I don't think in that sense they weren't being insincere. But the reduction of this in the music and film industry to a vibe of cultural change um, which there was a major shift in cultural change and that change being being sold to people in the 90s as a good change which was not the case either at the time or in the 1980s i think took the 80s to kind of remove the cultural memory so it could be resold to young people i mean you you think about the selling of the 60s and 70s throughout the entirety of the 90s to young people as you know as grunge develops the what you call yeah. the non-genre as um you know as hip-hop comes comes about yeah. yeah um as alternative and indie rock both develop kind of independent um mm -hmm. identities from their new wave and and post-punk past um and are radially marketable the only thing they can kind of turn to is this cultural, you know, this cultural, what I think is effectively recuperation and branding of capitalist events as part of this political zet guys, a political zet guys that is overstated. Like it's not even that real. Like it's because you know what else happens in the eighties that everybody forgets. And I, and I wrote this out of the, of the, uh, of the piece because I have a very great editor named Gene Bajlan mm -hmm. that told me in his British accent, I'm not even going to try to do it because I always sound like Robin Leach when I try to talk like Gene Bajlan. He said, uh, Jason, your problem is you know too much. You can't put all this in there. Everyone forgets about the Us Festival. Mm -hmm. A gentleman named Steve Wozniak, who people might know from their Apple computers, decided to throw one of the largest festivals in history in the desert and i think san bernardino um, yeah. it launches the career of uh, bands like motley Crue, and i think uh quiet riot hits number one soon after they play the us festival because there was an entire metal day uh, yep it's sunday the metal day uh saturday the new wave day you know um there was a country day which is kind of crazy <laughs> it's just crazy when you think about it but country <laughs> was still popular shows like hee haw still came on uh network Television. yeah i watched it as a kid like I watched Tiha as a kid, so yeah. So I mean, and, and I'm saying words right now. People are like I don't know what you guys are talking about. You know, it's on YouTube. Look it up. Yeah, Tee Haw and Soul Train were my introductions to music. So, <laughs> true facts. Like, <laughs> like watching Soul Train on the weekend and Tee Haw. <laughs> like I forgot when he. I think Tee Haw came in on Friday or Saturday night. But it was you know and. <laughs> And, and these, and the, with the, you were laughing. This was not on cable. This was on broadcast. Regular network television. Yeah. You I'm the same. Derek, I'm the same way. Yeah, I know. We're, we're about the same age. Solid Gold. <laughs> yep. Soul Train. Hee Haw. We uh, watched what was shows. A Saturday Night Special if you stayed up late enough? That was for Rock. Yes, super late. Yeah. Night <laughs> Flight and all that crazy shit. You said right. super late for that. But no, 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 no. Uh, the Us Festival. Didn't catch on. Wozniak lost a bunch of money. He had it to lose, but uh, and didn't really care, apparently. Um, no one talks about that when it comes to like massive festivals that were kind of game changers. And us festival for a lot of uh, artists of that time were massive game changers for them, especially when it came down to, to record sales. I think they performed in front of like a half million people close to it. Um, so you don't really have anything else domestically in the 80s because i believe live aid is overseas yeah a lot of it you have rock against racism which i think that's the only other thing that really happens and that kind of that gets complicated and it's mostly actually outside of the united states but that gets complicated mm -hmm. because of protests around evas costello i'm actually going to do a whole another podcast oh that's with, gonna be interesting uh with a friend about that because elvis costello uses a bunch of racial slurs um really drunk uh, to pit to deliberately piss off an American musician, a white woman American musician, uh, who was playing with Steels from the Crossing Seals and Nash uh, band, and 
there's a fallout from it. And Ray Charles basically steps in and ends the fallout. I won't repeat what he said, but he gets, even though he was, if you know Elvis Costello's lyrics, he's absolutely obsessed with the beginnings of the national front and its relationship to Oswald Mosley and, um, and stuff in the Britain. Um, and basically he, uh, has a rant where he calls uh, a bunch of, uh, of, he, he talks about how low class American artists are, um, and then use and very drunkenly, uh, calls, uh, Ray Charles, uh, something, something racial expletive. Um, and he also, this is when he's released is right after he released, uh, his, uh, album, um, uh, armed forces, which also uses the term white racial expletive, but, uh, as a term that would have been said about the Irish during, uh, during the forties. Um, and so this all gets, this all gets conflated in America. And so mm -hmm. even though he's a big promoter for rock against racism, he's being protested at the events and it kind of ends the show here and it kind of goes on in Britain. And it actually ends Elvis Costello's career here for a little while. He does get effectively canceled. Um, and then gets resold to the United States um uh in a in a weird thing um he's he's one of the few people i've known to really recuperate uh his image uh, and and do a lot uh, well, one of the things he does uh interestingly and this is a tangent we'll end it soon but like he records uh a you know almost blue which people don't realize is a tribute to Ray Charles because Ray Charles is famous. Like how Ray Charles breaks out to the music world. People don't know this is, and, 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 and people who think that it was just white people singing black music and that's how rock and roll started really don't know the history. And it's kind of dangerous to, mm -hmm. and, and a rewriting of the class origins of this music because Ray Charles grew up in country music and his first major breakout hit is him doing, uh, Georgia? jazz and blues takes oh. on country songs it's modern sounds of country and western music which is not a country album um but that wins him his wide audience that that actually builds a lot of the bridges that allows stuff like elvis and shit to happen later um and so elvis costello records this album that's basically him doing country music as a tribute partially to ray charles and to try to make amends with america and then he has a soul album uh i think the year before that's the same thing but the story of this, because I'm going to do a whole podcast of this later. Um, that's why I'm going into it in detail. But it, it kind of rock against racism fizzles, and then Live Aid happens abroad. So there is the beginning of this charity festival thing, mm -hmm. uh, but that really becomes more of a thing in Europe um, than here. And there's complicated reasons why it didn't seem to take off here. We're also talking about, like, I think people forget this. But like the South wasn't fully legally desegregated <laughs> until the late seventies, and was never de facto desegregated except in public institutions. So like, um, and the, and so these kind of concerts probably hit walls, uh, even though like, you know, black musicians could play pretty much anywhere. That had been broken. That had been broken largely even by Ray Charles. But like they probably hit raw walls of just not having enough interest. And where were you going to do it? Right. It, it, yeah. What kind of lineup are you going to put together? Um, exactly. We don't, we haven't seen it right after again, after Woodstock and the success success of the large show, you get the, just the kind of breakout success of seventies, massive album sales and arenas. And bands are now playing in in massive arenas and not you know doing a club and theater circuit anymore. Right. Um, yeah, Frampton I mean, comes alive, right? Right. Um, you a really live see, album. You Kiss. really see this too. I mean, like if it, sometimes it, even our popular retellings of this will actually show up, like in Rocket Man. Weirdly, like when you see Elton John coming to L.A. and you're like, they're playing. I mean, he's a fairly established artist by this point, and they're playing still still playing clubs. I'm like, yeah. Like the arena rock is a 70s, 80s thing. And it kind of also prevents the need for these festivals because individual recording artists are drawing these kinds of crowds. 
80,000 so, people showing up to see you on a Friday night, you know, in Los Angeles. And then you're going to go see another, you know, 80,000 or, or 100,000 in San Francisco. Do you really need a festival that's going to bring 200,000 people to the desert in L.A.? Exactly. You don't even know how to build that out anymore. You don't even you, to think to build that out how much money you'd have to put into it. Even if we think about these big shows that we're talking about, Live Aid, um, these are held in like Wembley Stadium. Where yeah, they're there's... held in sports arenas. So yeah, all you have to there's... do is bring the sound infrastructure, right? Like... Yeah, and that's an easy build out because you're used to building it out every night. It's a different, it's a whole different beast when you have to build out multiple stages um, and you have to literally implant an infrastructure, hope you have potable water, bathrooms. I mean, Woodstock left a bad taste in people's mouth for a long time and Altamont didn't make any better that this large festival can't really work outside of a large sports arena. You know, the open air uh, festival works well overseas. Um, their festivals are much larger and have been for, for some time. They have a literal festival season over there. It's massive. Um, it, it, per genre is they're ma more massive than anything we do. Um, They've just done it right from a logistical standpoint. Um, now we do it right here. Um, logistically, these things are done very, very well. Um, but when we talk about this era and this kind of forgotten era, I think we we can't we can't forget how big arena rock was in the '70s. Arena music was in the '70s, um, where you could have a three or four band bill. Uh, two nights or, or two shows in a night and uh, th that you kind of don't need a festival for that. And I think people forget, you know, this power law stuff that you have in music. We talked about this really productive period in the sixties. Well, the seventies is like in music, just like it is in film by the late seventies, you have basically arena rock is the blockbuster movie of music. <laughs> um, like that's like, they figured it out. They've figured out how to market a band push them out there and they figured out how to do it to niche markets too. But mm -hmm. we also forget that the radio market, the FM radio market was pretty unified at this point. Mm -hmm. Like they had, you'd have a country channel, a rock channel. And I think you begin to have either easy listening and oldies channels and uh, what a rhythm and blues channel would probably just been back then a black channel. Um, if you were in an urban, you quote, know, quote, yeah. yeah. If you were in an urban setting, um, and so you have basically five demographic selling points to do. So, this, and rock, rock and pop are the two kings, um, and with with rhythm and blues and stuff reaching out to wide audience at this time. I think you really start seeing that in the seventies. You see that in disco too. Um, oh, yeah. um, and then you have this this dance music craze in the seventies as well. So that's another part of this. But we have figured out how to market these how to market these music and also cross market them mm -hmm. so that like country music people listen to, you know, can, well, you know, they, they have their country identity, but they also listen to, you know, sometimes I'll listen to classic or well, what would them be just rock? Well, classic um, rock. Well, let's think about classic rock and country. There's what we now call classic rock uh, and, and country. There's a lot, there was a lot of, through lines between those two genres and Waylon Jennings is Waylon Jennings is Buddy Holly's bassist. Need I say like, right. and and he, he made his name by getting fired for playing Little Richard and Lubbock, Texas. Like like th th these worlds were not separated. I mean no. actually like rock and roll music is you take you take black blues, you take country music, you take you take uh br you take Scotch Irish folk music, which is also part of country music, and you squish it together, um, and and it's a and it's a kind of it's a refined version of lower class music, effectively. It's it's and the and also these markets in the '60s are regional, like mm -hmm. rock and roll comes out of Georgia, it comes out of Texas, then it comes out of LA, then it comes out of New York, but the but they're very regional distinct 
kind of movements. And like New York is more influenced probably by Britain in a lot of ways than it is even us. Like, the I mean, the do you really think the mamas and the papas sound like the Grateful Dead? I mean, they both come out of California, but the, those sounds are very different, right? They're extremely Does, different. Snare like, plane sound like shit. Who's coming out? The Doors. So. I do miss, to a certain degree, regional sounds. <laughs> There's something I dig about, uh, you know, listening to music from different regions and and having that region put its own little little flair on it. But uh, no, you're right. Uh, rock music back then. Luckily, living in the studio, I got to know um, some of the old school dudes. I'm talking back from this Grateful mm -hmm. Dead era. And, um, you know, music isn't categorized as much as it is now. If anything, it was categorized by ethnicity. Right, exactly. And and rock is interesting, and you even see it in, like, the Buddy Holly tour. It's a multi-ethnic tour. Mm -hmm. Like, um, Big Bob. Come you know. the last one. <laughs> Come the yeah. last one. Yeah, where, where Valens is on it, and I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah Jack Wilson like, on that as well. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so... You know, it didn't begin with Elvis, people. And so, like, <laughs> um, and I think, unfortunately, in, in your, this actually is a good bridge to part of your point about 94 and 99. Mm -hmm. um, in the 60s, California is just kind of solidifying its identity as the second cultural hub. New York is a cultural hub. The United States has always been interesting because New York has been a cultural hub and DC has been a political hub and they've not been the same place. Um, uh, that's not true in Europe. That's not true in a lot of other places. But in the 50s and 60s, when we talk about regional music, I also think, yeah, like these bands are doing very different things. Like also like even the Wailing Jennings, I, I love this. I love just bringing this up. But Waylon Jennings is Buddy Holly's bassist. He does not sound when he goes and does his own solo career anything like rock and roll. He's very much coming out of uh, you know a country aesthetic. It's a it's a different country aesthetic. It's opposed to Nashville. It's Austin. Mm -hmm. um, back when Austin still not a bunch of you know keep Austin weird. Mm, not at all. Yeah, you know, pre pre all that. Um, we mm -hmm. won't go into our rants about that. But um, I, I think that history is interesting because what you have is a commodification of kind of working class music and the interlap between different ethnic cultures mm -hmm. that produce that music being commodified and frozen and then marketed as a genre, mm -hmm. which had not really happened before. You know, I mean, you got to think like a lot of our music, like the prior the prior versions of this music is jazz and like American folk music, which is like barely commercialized. Yeah. Right. Um, it's, you know, it's like you go see shit live. We, you know, we have recordings of people doing live or very regional record pressings. And that's like the, that's most of the early 20th century um, for, for the American music uh industry is like you have regional radio regional press and you have big stars but they're regional big stars they're not um they're not generally world you know world you have to tour stars. yeah and you tour and you tour, tour regionally like and you have to get on a big show like you have to be broken with uh something like ed sullivan at the time mm -hmm. has to break you and not everybody was going to be on ed sullivan um i, I but I think we we overestimate the influence of the of the internet on the breaking up of the quote monoculture because one of the other things that we have to look at in the nineties, this is already over. Like the proliferation of genres really starts to kick up in the eighties, um, and by the nineties you have alternative, you have punk, you have neo ska, you have and. And some of these come out of ethnic music traditions, but a mm -hmm. lot of them are official. Are, are like, I love that you call grunge the non-genre because I want to talk about that because grunge is a place. It's not. There is no defining music ethos or sound to it because Pearl Jam really comes out of an arena rock tradition. Mother Love Bone is kind of an evolution of. 
of kind of grittier end of hair metal that becomes something else. I agree. Uh, um, Nirvana is Nirvana, Mud it's Honey, and, and the Meekins are hardcore post punk bands. Yep. Um, and they're given a label be, that's based off of basically we're we're Seattle, not Olympia. <laughs> and um <laughs> and that becomes a genre right like and seattle is emerging as a cultural and capital hub one of the interesting things about new metal that you point out and i think this is also true for hardcore uh is its hubs are regional um and but they're not old and by so and they're not la and they're not new york they're the the post-industrial midwest um they're forgotten parts of the south to some degree um uh and it's also now it now seems ham-handed and maybe accused of cultural appropriation or whatever but it was an attempt at a a multi-ethnic crossover genre of music that was aimed at slightly deracializing the genre. All right? I want to I want to say something. So I don't know if I I know, I know you know this about me. So Facebook just closed my personal account yep. years ago. Before that happened, and I'm a dummy for not transferring this over. Um, while I was going out working festivals and I also had friends and bands. I wasn't playing at this time that much. Um, I'd always ask people this question. I thought it was a fun conversation starter, especially if you come from heavy music. I'd say, do you think the initial backlash of new metal was racist? And every, the first time I'd ask that question, everybody always went like this. See the face Derek's making right now, people watching the show? Everyone made that face. Ooh. And because of the world I've been in for so long, I actually have friends coming on the show soon um, that are part of the first wave of new metal. Uh, Chris Contos from Machine Head's coming on soon. I'm actually really stoked about that um, as Machine Head celebrates their like 28th anniversary of their first record. Crazy, um, man. It's, I feel old um, when you say that. Um, <laughs> so I would ask these guys that, and their first reaction is always, whoa. And a buddy of mine who plays in an awesome band now i'm going to give them a shout out here called arm for apocalypse if you guys like really heavy dark stuff arm for apocalypse he played in a band called will haven um if you're familiar with the groups like the deftones for a while i asked him that question and he gave me out of everyone i asked i probably asked like 50 people this question of various ages too people our age people older than us and then, you know, younger cats as well that grew up literally in it. And his answer, he's about our age, Derek. And his answer was one of the best answers. He goes, yes. He goes, because first and foremost, it was the end of the mid-range Van Halen top end. And to bring in people of color into this thing that had been dominated by white people was frightening for a lot of people to see because they didn't know how to handle it. I'm not the biggest new metal fan. Writing this piece started out as a tongue in cheek joke to a young man who I don't know if you follow him on Twitter as well. His name is Gregory Hart and he's a like 23 year old kid that's running for office in Oklahoma, but he's some he's a Limp Biscuit fan. I think it's the funniest thing ever. And he had me <laughs> on his show and he talked to me for like two and a half hours. He wanted to ask me about music or whatever. But part of it was a tongue-in-cheek defense of new metal because I didn't think new metal is the reason why people destroyed uh, uh, Woodstock yeah. '99. Um, but one of the things about new metal that I mildly appreciate is the fact that heavy music truly doesn't just get multi-ethnic. You're now starting to blend genres. You're really starting to blend the drum patterns of 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 hip-hop and and r&b with heavier metal and certain bands do it better than others but even if you look at a group like kid rock and i'm definitely not a kid rock fan 
Never have been, but yeah. Kid Rock's first record, he comes to Oakland and records it with Too Short in the late 80s, early 90s. Mm -hmm. So him coming out with a fur coat and a pimp hat and talking about how he's a pimp, he was always supposed to be white Too Short. He was on Jive Records. He was supposed to be white Too Short. It didn't work out that well for him. Um, But that's always been his shtick. And if you looked at his band, um, it was somewhat of a multi-ethnic band. He had this badass black woman drummer um, that actually made that shit kind of, that's why your head nodded. <laughs> because you had this, this funky ass drummer and a lot of that music, these guys had some amazing. The rhythm uh, section on rhythms. Kid Rock is actually really good. I mean, you, it, it's one of those things like, I don't really totally want to admit I know that, but it's, <laughs> you, gotta, it, you can't it's run. Like, Bands like System of a Down, uh, I'm wearing a Deftone shirt because I am a fan. Uh, I mean, Deftones is fascinating, right? Because Deftones, like, I'm a huge Deftones fan. Uh, mm-hmm. I have been since I was a teenager. Mm-hmm. And one of the things I realized very early on is I'm like, they listen to New Wave as well as rap, as mm-hmm. well as Latin music. And if you, if you, if you start to isolate, like, I know how to play the drums, so I, I, I focus on rhythms first. But if you start to isolate the component parts and remove the distortion, you actually start hearing, okay, you hear Depeche Mode, you hear yes. Latin beat, you yes. hear um, you hear dance music in that. I mean, it's just – and I, I will say of the new metal bands, it's the one that's, that is still considered new metal that's kind of been artistically redeemed – but this was a trend, and it was a trend that I traced to two things that happened in the early 90s. One is Rage Against the Machine, which is uh, as, as ludicrous as Rage Against Everything can sometimes be by the late 90s. That's huge. It is a lot of it's a lot of poor middle class white people's introduction, not just to black music, but also to like Latin radicalism and stuff. Like I learned who Angela Red Davis Wilson. was. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I learned about I learned about Shining Path <laughs> um, from from uh, you uh, know. <laughs> You Maybe know. you learned about the Zapatistas, but you Beth and definitely knew Shining Path was. They had a whole video, right? It's like it was a Shining Path promotional. I learned, um, but the other thing that starts happening too is people seize this, or and it really starts before new metal. And I and I, there's an album. It's totally a it's totally a cash grab album, but it's one of these times where capitalism actually does something progressive. <laughs> and it's the Demon Knight soundtrack. I, if you were, or Judgment Knight soundtrack, do you Judgment remember? Night yes, the Judgment Knight soundtrack. Like Dell the it, Funky Homo sapien Dinosaur Jr. Right, Hill, and I forget who they played with. Yeah, it's 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 alternative and metal bands, largely out of out of you know different scenes like Dinosaur Jr. out of Midwest too. It's you know it's not a uh, cultural. Most of these bands, interesting, also fit this. They don't come out of L.A. or New York. Yeah, um, and they're paired with up and coming hip hop acts, mm-hmm. and they make music together for this. And that CD. No one fucking remembers that movie, but that soundtrack, it's like the Crow soundtrack, right? We all remember the fucking Crow soundtrack. We don't actually, like, we all think we like the Crow movie. It's okay. You like the soundtrack. You like the soundtrack. And, and this, and this is, this is that too. This is from this, and this is from a time period where they're trying to figure out how to market. You know, (laughs) this isn't grunge. We don't know really how to sell this stuff. It's kind of related to grunge. Uh, Hair metal just collapsed. Yeah, you know, as a as a yeah. as a as a genre, people are tired of it, and they're throwing spaghetti against the wall. New metal emerges out of that. What's interesting is there are there are regional bands like there was a, even a Macon band called Smiley's Gear Shift, and if you're not from Macon, you've never heard of this. Mm-hmm. Um, that started experimenting with mixing different genres of rock with rap, and I the, I think the other example of this is Three Eleven. Uh, not a band I like, not new metal, but there's a lot of rap type sounds that come out of this. Um, and you start hearing this in the skater scene, which was always multi-ethnic, but never kind of expressed in the music the sk- as being the multi-ethnic. Scene. 
I'll give you a band that you might remember because we're around the same age and you might not. No. The first ever metal band with a DJ are some friends of mine called Mordred. I have heard of them, but I didn't listen to them at the time. And the, the, go back and everyone, if you want to get it, see what this stuff looked like in the 80s, they have a song called Every Day is a Holiday. You know, they had they literally had a DJ in 86. Uh, Corey Taylor wow. from Slipknot cites them as an influence for how he wanted Slipknot to look. Right. Um, and I guess the other major influence is Faith No More. Faith No More and Epic, but it's just Epic. Yeah, it's just Epic. Mike Patton doesn't do that the rest of the time, and that's not even a Mike Patton song. So, like, yeah, it's um, it's just it's just Epic, and and Faith No More has always been its own thing. They're a huge inspiration on anything I've ever done musically. I love too. those dudes to death. They've been ex- extreme helps to everything I've done musically. But uh, Faith No More and Epic, Anthrax and Public Enemy. Um, uh, I guess we're on DMC and Aerosmith. Even run DMC and Aerosmith it. lets you feel a little comfortable with it. Mm-hmm. The Judgment Night soundtrack, I think, actually, sometimes people forget about how important that was to really Huge. get used to and get comfortable with the melding of these two things. Um, and I also think we also forget from a political standpoint, from a political economy standpoint, you have a growing black middle class in the 80s. Right. And also, when you even look at a band like Fishbone, if they tell you how their sound got cultivated it has a lot to do with busing in southern california and they're mm-hmm. going from like the south central area and going to school in an area called the valley which is more uh white middle class and they're meeting these valley kids that are all about punk rock and they're all about funk music and they're seeing a bit of a through line in those things and um when you hear a band like fishbone you're like oh <laughs> this is this is why those things work well together right for me personally i i, I love them i love them um and, you know, and i think this had happened before but it actually really the real predecessor for this is the influence of ska on punk uh and reggae on punk in mm-hmm. britain with the jamaican refugees and the lower and 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 the lower class parts of town mm-hmm. uh and that gets replicated in New York a little bit, but they're copying the British and not the, it's not the same kind of organic thing that happened. Yes. Um, but what I find interesting is nobody ever link people talk about that, but they don't link new metal to that. And I'm like, new metal is a very similar development. Um, and it also shows how much, you know, you know, black punk was a thing. There's been black punk bands and, and Latin punk bands forever. Um, mm-hmm. since there's been punk bands, mm-hmm. well, at least pretty soon after there's punk bands, um, you know, and you have other multi ethnic brands like X and stuff. But what new metal does is new metal picks up on this grunge thing, which is dying because it's not a genre and they don't, it doesn't really have a coherent identity. Like, go back and listen to Pearl Jam and Nirvana and tell me what they actually share. Thank you. Um, like, they share yeah. plaid. They share plaid and they share that's Pacific cool. Northwest. That's, yep, it. that's it. That's <laughs> it. Like, um, and the other thing I wanted to, I, I tell people, and I'm like, go listen to that Kurt Cobain album that was released 10 years later or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, that's the recordings. A lot of this post punk, heavy, hardcore stuff. Mm-hmm. Was also headed in the same direction as new metal, and no one wants to own up to that. Like, I think Nirvana would have sounded a lot like some of these new metal bands if they had if if they had stayed around and Kurt not died and Dave Grohl not taken you know his career back to more or less an arena rock sort of trajectory. You know, those guys were going a hardcore direction, and what does Nova Selleck do? Nova Selleck goes and joins the homies Flipper. Uh, right. As soon as Kurt dies and does a record with them, record or two, I think, with them. Um, Flipper's back on tour, by the way. Uh, so I agree with that. I, I, I think in my interviews that I can remember about new metal, and again, and the answers definitely, there was a huge, wide spectrum of answers from fuck that noise, I don't want to talk about it, to oh, I have an interesting take. And a lot of the more interesting takes were about the sonic change. And I could definitely see Nirvana going in that route because Kurt wasn't a guy for guitar solos. So new metal for me is kind of the more simplistic parts of, of heavy music. There's, there's something called a palm mute, 
If right. you've ever heard, you know, Metallica's popular now with Stranger Things, right? So when you hear the first note in Master of Puppets, you you bury the your this part of your thumb on the on the low E string and you hit down on it where the string doesn't necessarily ring out very loud. You go zhun. with all the distortion, you get to zhun. And when you have double guitars and bass, that becomes more massive. And new metal is taking that junk and just playing that to the drums instead of the drums and bass doing their thing and the guitar playing over it like rock music has been for years. It's the guitars playing to the drums. So that's why a lot of the new metal stuff is like a lot of open notes. And then chorus is that soar. Um it's interesting what you talking about this because I I've always noticed how much new metal took from the hardcore scene. Oh, um, yeah. not not the postcard hardcore scene like Nirvana or like the like you're talking about like the first wave, like yeah, the first wave, yeah, black flag, and, you know, black flag, yeah. and then and then later grind uh, grindcore and metalcore later actually are re- directly related musically yes. to yes. new metal, even though we don't want to admit it. And then you know there's progressive metal has managed to like we're not new metal although we all thought tour was new metal in the 90s <laughs> um but we yeah. all do the same polyrhythm because what's called a polyrhythm so you're right. playing a polyrhythm dun, 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 dun. and what you're talking about what derek's talking about with progressive music uh what new metal was doing to even simplify it more was the bringing these seven string guitars Mm-hmm. where there's an extra low E string that's tuned to tune down all the way to a um and then and a lot of stuff is already tuned to drop d too so so now you're 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 a whole two steps lower sonically so you have this just massive tone and you're playing polyrhythms and for the more progressive stuff now these guys are playing nine strings i have a good friend that's the official nine string player for emg um and you're talking not <laughs> so what's that like a yeah. low e <laughs> so i mean progressive metal sort of differentiates itself from new metal one because it doesn't incorporate rap and two even though it does incorporate a lot of like go listen to early tour there's a lot of ethnic drumming stuff yes. in that. um and and like tribal tribal drum like i'm like i I'm like, I hear Doombex in this, man. Like, I, I hear Doombex. You gotta have, you gotta have those polyrhythms, and these guys are playing to those polyrhythms, mm-hmm. and then you start getting into those weird time signatures. I think new metal is an oversimplified version of that. Right. You're not getting any kind of crazy seven four time signatures with new metal. You're getting simplistic four four stuff, or even four on the floor stuff with bands like Corn. Do, do, do. you know it's it's it's, it's almost disco-y some of the right. stuff they're doing but just with that that lower but it's hidden from you because it's dropped so low <laughs> and, hidden out, and hidden behind a wall of like fuzz distortion yes so you don't hear you know everything that's going on some of that's because that covers up mistakes in the music just like with punk and hardcore i mean hardcore also does a lot of this because it's it, it is a it is a not musician nerd form of music Mm -hmm. but i do think tool's an interesting band to talk about because we thought of tool as like that's high-end new metal until we rebranded it and realized oh that's progress that's progressive rock on you know a metal acid basically (laughs) but but, uh but we didn't know that in the 90s that doesn't really come until lateralis and we like put it together um but a lot of these bands i remember when we first when i first listened to them i'm like this sounds like tool but simpler with mm. rap and then you would hear either disco or soul mm-hmm. and sometimes white boy soul i think i think the white boy soul element of this is oxen lost and i, I want to point out limp biscuit got famous doing a george michael cover yep uh so <laughs> like in it yes we all read it as ironic but in some ways it's absolutely not so like that that trajectory is interesting um and as a as a fourteen year old kid who was in this music and lived in a multi racial multi ethnic, this spoke to multiple worlds at once. Yes, because the one thing I want people, you know, I talked on your show once, and, and like Pascal, like freaked out. And I'm like, this was more common than you realize. Like in southern cities, particularly in Georgia and Florida, when stuff like Freak Nick was happening, there's still a punk and metal scene, and we're still playing. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. And we overlap and run into each other. Mm -hmm. And there's also the beginnings of a black middle class. There were, I lived in a lower middle class suburb, uh, su suburban neighborhood, ex-urban neighborhoods to sort of like was kind of suburban now. Um, and in that area, this was people coming out of project housing and trailers. They'd gotten enough money to buy like a, a cheap former mill, former mill house or one of those 70s, 80s, like real crappy constructions. Um, and at first they were all white. Um, but by by the middle of the 90s, uh, they start getting called transition neighborhoods because like <laughs> because there are a few, you know, actually better off. Um, usually than the white people in the same community, black people, like I lived by a, a, a black pastor, but lived behind me. Um, and what, and so we are also culturally more together and I'm in a Confederate, a former Confederate state. So we are bust and integrated in the high schools as best we can. So before white flight turns to almost all private schools uh, and this, this area that I lived in didn't have a private school. There wasn't even one to go to. So we were a 50 50 school. And yeah, if you went into lunchroom, you'd see a couple of white kids go over on the, on the white side, uh, on the black side of the room and a couple of black kids go over on the white side of the room, but there's very clearly a black and white side, mm -hmm. but we knew each other. We interacted with each other. We were friends. We understood there were boundaries that you did not cross. Mm -hmm. Um, like when I would go visit my black friends, like the cops would tell me because they couldn't figure out why the hell I was in the black. <laughs> like He's literally not. like, like they're like, what's this white kid doing here? He's either stupid or he's up to no good. Uh, well, you know, another thing we've, we're not, we're not even hitting on an after Woodstock, what you get is things like the Sprite liquid mix tour. And oh, yeah. that's when Sprite was mixing the hip hop groups of the day with more contemporary harder rock groups so as derek was mentioning 311 um 311 hoobastank jay-z um i want to say the roots were part of it for a minute um mixing of genres started to become more and more popular um if you remember method man and limp biscuit have a song together on the the album with nookie i think it's three dollar bill y'all um they have a song together so these worlds are definitely crossing and there's a shared experience in these worlds. Um, so when you think about the tours these bands had been on, especially the first Ozfest, the first Ozfest is kind of dominated by these guys on the small stages. You have bands like Seven Dust. That's where Seven Dust becomes friends with Snot kitty is is out of canada they've consistently been multi-ethnic uh limpus to get the incubus another multi-ethnic band um pod is multi-ethnic po got pod most of these new metal bands have some brown people in there right it's just it's just the makeup of where they're from like we're talking about these people aren't coming from the 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 superstar cities outside of bands like lincoln park right you know they're literally from 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 LA, but uh, all they're the groups from, that we're naming right now, nobody's really from a from a superstar area. Yeah, and, and so I mean, I also like we were talking about butt rock the other day, and I was and <laughs> uh, and I don't even understand that categorization. And they had a lot of because another thing that happens with new metal is is it gets associated with this post grunge arena rock, and I don't really know why. I mean, this like is Creed. Really, yeah, it gets associated with Creed and Creed and <laughs> Breaking it, Benjamin. I think there's a tonal quality, right? Because Creed there's is this muddiness to, to the sound, right? There's a, there's a there's a part of that grunge scene. This is just my we've so deviated, and that's fine. If people are mad. I'll, I'll take that L for for. We're gonna do a whole second show. episode now just on what's done. Okay, like, I, I, I've, I've think, made it decided. So, because if, if you think about this, I did this tour. We have two music nerds talking about politics and music. It's not you, gonna you, go got, well. you got me thinking about this tour I was on uh, uh -huh. I met, when I actually met my ex in 2009. I did this tour with this band that was more radio rock friendly. 
Mm-hmm. And they were into Alter Bridge and Creed and Breaking Benjamin and Nickelback. And it, th- like those things weren't bad words to them. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I have one rule on tour and that's whoever's driving picks the music. Mm-hmm. You got to deal with that L um, because you got to drive. And we were towing a big ass trailer and they're like, we're hiring you to tour, manage and drive. I was like, OK, well. Y'all aren't all that other shit that I had to hear when y'all were driving. You're going to hear my shit. now. But in listening to that shit, one thing I will say is there was a tonal quality to a lot of that stuff because there is an overproduction to it. New metal yeah. also wasn't done on a four track. These guys, most of them got, you know, pretty big deals. Um, the deaf tones to me are the exception to that because Terry date who did the first three or four deaf tones records, Terry date is coming off of doing, pantera albums right so it's a very different he knows how dimebag needs to get his his crunch over and the first deftones record actually is in standard tuning yeah go back and listen to adrenaline um he's playing the chords a little differently but it's standard tuning and terry day doesn't know what to do with it sonically so the deftones aren't the biggest fans of that first record because sonically it doesn't really sound like what you get with adrenaline where they kind of uh, I'm sorry, adrenaline. I'm sorry, around the fur, where they kind of figure out, you know, this is how this band should sound. And also, Stefan tunes down to to drop uh, C sharp, where mm-hmm. a lot of bands are. And that's where a lot of that the music that you're talking about, the post grunge stuff, is coming from. And also, these guys are very comfortable with the drop D. Soundgarden was comfortable with drop D. Nirvana right. was comfortable with drop D. Um, I think maybe even Stone Temple Pilots, one of the few bands not from Seattle that gets lumped into grunge because of at the time. They sound a little bit like Pearl Eddie Jam. Vedder. Yeah. yeah. I mean, even Scott though you go Lewin back and listen was... to it, they actually sound a lot more like Creed. But <laughs> oh, dude, go back and listen to the first Stone Temple Pilots with like sex type thing. Like, I am, I am, I am. Yeah. It, 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 they do interesting yeah. stuff later actually but i think velvet Number revolver four, as yeah. annoying as that band was is a return to yes. early stone temple pilots and and not the experimental form that we all kind of remember post the crow soundtrack and kind of block out like creep and sex type thing and um and everyone's like oh no the the gen the gen xers are now totally in there i mean look, dude, I, don't, but- I don't care <laughs> about any of that i think Go back and listen to some of that music because I think it's good. It, things run in cycles. I'm I'm watching videos now of there's a young black girl that's that's getting all this press and guitar magazines mm-hmm. and blogs. She's a pretty decent player, um, but she plays new metal. I'm like, there's a there's a there's new new metal, but it sounds exactly like old new metal. Like there's no difference. Huh. Just it's just a there's like oh this is a new band. They sound like these hardcore bands from the '90s. There's a band called Turnstile. I don't know if you heard him. I'm yeah, like, I have oh, heard of Turnstile. Like, I don't hate it, but I heard it already. I, you know what, though? I This, I want to defend this slightly because I do think in most of these movements, if you listen to the first iterations of this, they're mm-hmm. copying almost verbatim some other thing. Yeah. Um, uh, b- because, like I, I, like, I always point out, Pearl Jam is just drop, it's just drop D Arena Rock. It's just Arena Rock in a different is. tuning. Like, all it is. Like, that's all it. That's all it is. That's all they've ever wanted to be. Have you seen the, this viral video of them breaking? And have you seen it? Mm-hmm. Where the dude, the, the new one, where the dude breaks the guitar. Did I send it to you? Oh no, Mike right. McCready out of nowhere, out of nowhere, uh-huh. just breaks the guitar and then takes his guitar and destroys some beautiful amps, and the response was. Must be nice to be that rich to destroy <laughs> all that vintage gear. <laughs> then he destroys his pedal board, and it's like that's really, really, bro. Like that's that's where you are right now. And you could have just threw that guitar out to a fan and made someone's whole life. Uh, yeah, if you're gonna do, if you're gonna get rid of shit, I mean, yeah. that's who they are, right? Yeah, that's it, it, and and it's and it's funny because it is that is some arena rock. I don't give a damn. I'm going to tear up the hotel room and a poor person is going to clean it up as bullshit. Yeah. I mean that, yeah, that's, that's the who I, you know what that, you know, 
actually, I, I have to let you guys. We're going to do a second episode. We haven't gotten to watch to what's like ninety nine yet. Um, but well, there's an interesting class dynamic to that because mm-hmm. a lot of what that is, in my mind, um, if you see with, with the Who, you have formerly working class people because the Who's one of those weird British bands that actually is where uh, half of it comes out of the working class le- legitimately um with basically psychological problems from being in the working class you know and in the case of like two of the who members like le- both dependency and ptsd really mm-hmm. um and you give them a shit ton of money and and one of the ways this expresses itself and i can say this I think people maybe underestimate how reactionary giving poor people a lot of money makes them, but it's because you're like, you get to live the fantasy of what you think people are doing to you all the time are. And so a lot of these people start these trends and you're like, Oh, this is like, this is undiagnosed mental health issues. This is, this is, uh, this is, and now I've given you a shit ton of money in cocaine. Um, but it then that gets associated with the glamorous lifestyle. So you have like rich yuppies coming into this field too. Like, Oh, I got to act like that guy for authenticity. So now we're going to shit on people. And, and you can literally see this. So I got, I, this occurred to me when I was reading like the who's uh, various members of the who's biographies. And I was like, Oh, that's what this is. This is like, I have psychological problems and I, and I'm poor and I always have money, and you know who I can get back at? Everybody who's Everybody. poorer than me. Like, who may have been slightly, like, slightly better off when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. Um, and that manifests in a lot of this Nablisha Blisha. I think that manifests in hip-hop, too. I think a lot of, like, the hip-hop bling shit is nothing but that. Um, uh, and it hasn't looked back since, right? Yeah, it, yeah, it hasn't that's... checked itself since. And I mentioned something about hip hop in the piece. I call it kind of a expression of of neoliberal bootstrapping. Um, and I and I'm a fan of hip hop, you know. So I'm not I'm not throwing. But stones yeah, this time period piece. was actually probably the worst period for that too. But we we have to do another. I we got to do, we gotta do, we gotta do we gotta do an episode on the late '90s because we just barely got into new. <laughs> new <laughs> I, I, I I apologize for. <laughs> For derailing it, but for me, and this is the problem when I was writing the piece, there's so much context I want to put into the genre of music, the live music world in which it sat in, because when you think about Woodstock, and it's always corn and it's always Limp Biscuit, mm-hmm. right? It's never Seven Dust played that same show. They're a new metal band as well. Um, that crowd was in a rage when they played, but, you know, I think the uh, big point you make is like the big, the worst shit actually happens in the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Red Hot they Chili kind Peppers. Of, that's they the they most actually kind of... shit ever. Let's, let's just be honest, dude. I've owned their album California. I'm not proud of it, but <laughs> it's the it's the broiest shit ever. And next that time period is also their most broy time period. Oh, too. they're broed out. <laughs> like that's why they headlined. Right. That wasn't a number one album at that time. Millennium by the Backstreet Boys was right. <laughs> yeah, I know. So we, I, we, look, we went. I'm sorry, D. Let's do it again. We're we'll gonna do it, it again. There is no. There's no if. There's no scheduling. It's a matter of J. Here's the time. We'll do it. I hope people enjoy this. Uh, I think they will. And I think. Explain. I think yeah, there's nostalgia, but I think people need to like think about the class origins and the political economy of this music because it actually does matter. And I think both, you know, there's two, there, there's a couple of narratives that I like fight with my admittedly from an upper middle class background partner on. <laughs> um, and, and one of them is like, she's like, well, white people still black people music. And that's the history of rock and roll. And I'm like, yes and no. Like, y- like, yes, a bunch of right producers stole music from people who, you know, and sold them to particular artists. And yes, Elvis did a lot of people wrong. Like, but this has been an interchange and it's been an interchange its entire history, even when you were watching it in your 20s and teens. Like, mm-hmm. like it's always been an interchange. It's never not been an interchange. It's just, just somehow invisible to people. 
Um, Cultures to be shared, right? Right. I I am a young, yeah, I was, uh, I'm a 44-year-old black man. I'll be 45 on the 19th of August. And I play music that is, that is inspired by uh, bands like Metallica to bands like Flipper to bands like Black Flag to, to bands like uh, uh, Parliament, right? Mm-hmm. But no one accuses me of any sort of cultural appropriation because it's always going to be different what I'm trying to do with that music that I'm inspired by. And when I hear Led Zeppelin, I definitely hear Delta Blues, but through the sensibilities of British people and, you know, Marshall Stacks opposed to Fender Deluxes with no distortion. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, th- I think that's, I think the sharing culture is fine. I think we can talk about the, I hate cultural preparation as a term because there's like seven different things it really is. And some of them I think are legitimately bad. Some mm-hmm. of them are capitalist and like, and cultural preparation is really about, capitalist remuneration and some of it some of it really doesn't make sense like you know because when i'm like okay so who stole whose culture uh and blues like like because i hear scotch irish licks and and black music from the 20s and i'm not complaining like Mm -hmm. um you know uh and so i just i don't i also i don't want to paint this as like ever having been a post-racial utopia even in the 90s but like i think lower class people which unfor- which unfortunately and unfortunately has been where we have gotten mm-hmm. most of our popular music mm-hmm. is always more ethnically interconnected because you can't afford to shield yourself whether you're racist or not mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. like you just can't afford it um, and that stuff starts to look a little different in the 90s in my opinion because it's not coming from the ghettos of Detroit. No, it's right. coming from it's coming from people being burst out to suburbia and then coming back into the city. Like that's yeah. what's going on. Yeah. Rep, yeah. we're gonna come back and talk specifically about Woodstock '99 and the actual events, and then <laughs> and then the fallout. Uh, so come back in a few weeks. Jason and I can talk music all day. Apparently, we 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 even privately don't, but we share a lot of this. So. Well, um, I'm trying to get Derek. Look, I'm going to say this on air so <laughs> we can convince the the Varn Nation to to get you down here. I'm trying to get Varn down here to Mexico, where he has lived previously. Uh, not, well, in not in your region. part, not in your part, but yeah, not in my part, aka the good part. Uh, <laughs> trying to get Varn down here. I lived in the dangerous part. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and because uh, because because Ben Burgess is coming down here uh, in a couple weeks. We're going to do an episode out here on the terrace overlooking the ocean um so we got to get varn down here doing an episode on the terrace where we will uh tell tales of uh music stories and band shit and we will argue who was what and yeah. is sepultura the true proto new metal band and uh Ooh. Yeah, and it's soul fine new metal. Anyway, um, yeah, <laughs> questions that might be answered later. All right, and also we're trying to get Varn to the LA show, so then we can all go to the Rainbow, and maybe we'll broadcast from the Rainbow post show, and uh, you can see Varn hanging out with Slash. Whoa, that'd be awesome. <laughs> Careful what you I'm a big, for. I'm a big, I'm a big Slash's Snake Pit fan, and no one remembers that. Be band. careful what you <laughs> wish for. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, um, thanks for coming on. We'll do this again in a few weeks and we'll get all this stuff done. Have a great evening.